Good morning, everyone. How are we this morning? It's good to be here and be reminded of a new day and a new year. I do believe um, that God wants to give us individually and as a church a new day, not looking back to where we were and where we have been or going backwards because people are getting old or whatever, but going forward. And he has new things in store for us. And we have a choice, like Tanya shared. Um, and even the songs that we've sung, they, uh, I realized once again, uh, that happens commonly, that actually fits to a theme. It may not be totally obvious um, as we continue in our study of the book of Revelation, but um, indeed we do have a choice, an important choice, which hopefully will become more clear as we go on what I'm talking about. We continue in our study of the book of Revelation, and I'll do a quick recap um, of some of the things, not from the beginning, um, but um, as we lead on to our main study, which I've called It Is Done. It's actually a quote um, from the passage of scripture we are studying today, a few chapters, mainly two, but a bit of a lead up to them. It is all about the fall of Babylon and what we mean by Babylon, uh, we'll look into. Actually, a uh, um, couple of weeks ago in the Finnish service, Timo was sharing, uh, he was uh, sharing the message and um, had been really studying into Babylon in the Bible. And um, we need to get him to do that in English as well. Um, but um, I'll, um, I'll share some thoughts, um, but also other things around it. But again, as a reminder for us, um, the words right from the beginning uh, of the book, book of Revelation that it is the ble who are blessed, we are blessed, is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. The time is getting closer and closer and nearer and nearer. Um, as I was um, reflecting on the message uh, that I had been preparing and uh, the passage of scripture, um, I thought all oh, this sort of summary statement came to me, which really aims to summarize um, the challenge we face as we're studying these uh, chapters, and I'll say which chapters shortly. It is time for the pure to be purer still in following Jesus. It is time for the pure to be purer still in following Jesus. And hopefully, um, well, certainly the Bible passages we'll look at presently will um, illustrate that or make that very clear. So in our study, we have been looking, um, and I'm not going all the way uh, to revise from chapter one uh, of Revelation, um, but, um, Last time, we, which was two weeks ago, we were looking at chapters 12, 13, and 14, and um, it was a bit of a mammoth session because we covered a whole lot of things because there are a lot of things happened there. And I called uh, that section um, Science, Beasts, and Angels because that's exactly what it was. Uh, there were all sorts of interesting signs. Uh, the woman who we understand is Israel, the red dragon, um, he was fighting against the woman uh, and the dragon is Satan and the male child and no one's quite sure what that means in the different interpretations, something that was uh, Christ, others that uh, that was the firstborn or the first fruit of the Jewish believers. And then we saw a great fight in the heavenly realm between the angels of God led by Michael and the angels of Satan and Satan lost and was thrown down to earth and uh, it was a uh, woe to the earth because Satan's now really, really, really angry because he knows that he's only got a short time. Then we saw things got worse. Um, two beasts with dra the dragon Satan sort of watching on and giving his authority and power to them. First, a beast from the sea, which we understand is talking about the Antichrist, and we'll refer more to that today, and the beast from the earth, which is his false prophet 
Then we did see a bit of a glimmer of uh, something more pleasant, the Lamb, Jesus Christ, in heaven in Mount, on Mount Zion with, uh, with um, the 144,000 um, who've been purchased by his blood and praising God. Then lots of angels um, came on the scene. The first one, and this is the first time, and uh, maybe uh, Kirsty can correct me, I think the only time in Scripture that actually we see the angel um, uh, proclaiming the gospel of salvation. At this point of time, the gospel is left by Jesus for us, his followers, to proclaim. But then, at the end of time, the angel will fly and proclaim the gospel, followed by another angel who is proclaiming the fall of Babylon, which will uh, uh, be the main topic today, followed by another angel who was making it very, very, very horribly clear that those who follow Satan do not follow Jesus. They have a horrible eternal death waiting for them. And then we saw the two reapers who threw their sickles down on earth and reaped um, the harvest of the earth and the wine uh, harvest of the earth to the wine press of the wrath of God. So it's pretty horrible, serious stuff. And um, now we'll um, go to chapters 17 and 9, well, 17 to 18, actually. I won't have time to go to the first part of 19. I may make a brief mention to it. But before that, that's skipping two chapters, 15 and 16, which are the bowls of wrath. Now, those who've been sort of following this series before, you remember sometime last year, earlier on, um, we did go, did go through the three lots of seven judgments of God, the seal judgments, um, the trumpet judgments, and the bowls of wrath. So we've kind of covered 50, chapters 15 and 16, but I do want to make use that as a short bridge to refer back to that, but not going through them in, in a detail. Um, because that naturally leads on then to the judgment of Babylon, which is the main uh, topic. And I put a couple of extra lines there. So the end is near. Uh, well, it may be eschatologically, but also for this series after today, God willing, um, we are getting into a far, far, far more pleasant, in fact, the highlight chapters of the book of Revelation, um, the, the marriage of the Lamb and the new heaven and the earth, and the final exhortations for us to follow Jesus and be faithful. Now, before I go to a quick look at the bold judgments, um, just these, which I didn't really, um, kind of would have fit in uh, with the last, um, the last week with the message, but a um, bit of a summary, a comparison between um, God's reality and satanic imitation. On so the left side, what is God's picture and God's um, institutes? compared to what Satan is imitating. And there's a few things. So this is a bit of a summary and a bit of a recap, but also to the future. God, and we often talk about God as being triune or there's the Trinity. God in three per persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in these chapters of Revelation, we see an unholy Trinity of Satan with a dragon, as we saw, um, the beast, and the false prophet. Satan uh, often imitates God, but in a horrible, converse, reverse, uh, convoluted way. Then we've seen the book of Revelation talking about the lamb as if, being, as if slain, a clear reference to Jesus who died for our sins. Um, but um, the satanic um, false image is the many-headed beast which had a healed wound, uh, which we saw briefly last time, and the people of the earth were wondering about that, oh, wow, etc. cetera. Um, again, a parody or a mock of um, uh, Jesus. Then we have the sealing of the saints, which we saw a few, some time ago, as opposed to the mark of the beast. Sealing with the name of God and his holy city or mark of the beast. Then we had the bride, in white, which is the church of believers in Jesus from all nations on the earth, versus, and we'll look at this one today, the prostitute. I'm sorry, I'm using some bad words here, but um, this is exactly what the Bible is talking about. The prostitute in scarlet, red, and purple. And we'll look at that uh, very shortly. But 
very quickly about the seal judgments uh, and the introduction to them. Um, initially in chapter 15, John saw uh, a marvelous sign in heaven uh, with angels with the seven last plagues. Um, and it says in verse 1, uh, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. Is finished, so there's a finality coming up, which we'll come back to uh, in a little while. And then there was a bit more pleasant uh, thought. There was um, a, a sea like a sea of glass uh, with, um, mixed with fire. And those who had been victorious over the beast uh, there, and they were singing an interesting song, the song of the Lamb of Jesus and the song of Moses. And I picked that because that does help to remind us, going back to basics, we are saved, we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. He was the sacrifice accepted to the God, him who had no sin, God made sin for us. He took our sins on himself on the cross of Calvary and died so you and I can be free. That's the redemption, the freedom Christ has bought for us. Now, this was foreshadowed um, around 1500, whatever years before, uh, at the time of the first exodus, when the Israelites were in Egypt. And then God was leading them out of the slavery of Egypt uh, through Moses and uh, instructed Moses and Aaron to tell the people of Israel to celebrate the first Passover. Because on that night, God passed over the houses of the Israelites. Why? Because they had sacrificed a lamb, a one-year-old lamb without any blemish um, and uh, painted its blood outside of their doors, on the door frames. And the angel of God with the last plague for Egypt, the unrepentant Egyptian Pharaoh, because God wanted to lead his people out of Egypt, out of bondage. Then uh, the last, last punishment to Pharaoh and the Egyptian was the killing of the firstborn. But the Israelites who were behind the door with the blood of the lamb, they were saved, they were safe. And then the Egyptians told them to get out of here, run out, all of you. We don't want to see you anymore. And there's a long history after that, which we're going to go into now, the whole Exodus. But that, when they got out of Egypt and crossed the Red Sea, Moses sang a song, thanking God, praising God. And also the whole book of Deuteronomy um, is essentially a speech or song of Moses, praising God for his deliverance. And so now, when Jesus came, died on the cross, he bought our true deliverance from the bondage, not of an earthly power, but from sin and the power of sin and all the powers of sin. So we do well to keep remembering that. So in this way, even in this picture, the song of Moses and the song of Lamb, they go together. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful um, reminder for us. Um, and then the temple of God was filled with smoke and his glory. And no one could enter the temple until after the seven bold judgments had been poured out. That reminds us again about the horrible, horrible final, severe judgments that were about to come on, um, on the earth, in fact, targeting this time directly affecting human beings. These were judgments from God. God himself was in his temple, full of his glory that people couldn't enter until it was over. Um, and God's purpose, even through these judgments, um, affecting the earth, sea, rivers and springs, the sun, beast throne, the Euphrates River and the earth and the air, they were all affecting people. And it said all the people, so it's totality. Um, horrible, horrible things um, foretold. Um, but people still blaspheme God. God, even through these final judgments, was drawing people's attention. Hang on, I am here. Turn from your sinful ways. And there was still time for repentance. Even that angel had been proclaiming the gospel and still people would not turn back from their rebellious ways and their blasphemy on top of it. They even blasphemed God um, in the pain of their judgments. 
And um, that's, that's a horrible state to be in. The sixth, um, the sixth um, bowl, when it was poured out, after that, um, and we won't read it, uh, there were three frogs coming out of the demonic trinity. And some interpreters interpret that to be demonic or satanic propaganda. Because they were actually demonic spirits gathering the people and the armies together for battle against God. Israel and God, his people, to a place called Armageddon. But after that sixth bowl, there is the third blessed in the Bible. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And he continues, and they, the frogs, gathered them together to a place which in Hebrew is called Armageddon. So this was like a bracket almost in the revelation, noting that in the middle of all this building up of demonic activity, blessed are those who still hang on, keep their clothes pure. Now it's not talking about physical nakedness, but spiritually, not being contaminated by the world, uh, and stays awake. Complacency is one of the issues which is facing us even in my old profession in public health um, about the pandemic, and I'm not here talking about the pandemic, but complacency. And in many, many other ways in our society, we are facing complacency, so we just roll along. So you'll be right, mate. And that's fine, there's, um, it's good relaxed attitude in a lot of ways, I'm not knocking that, but there's the wrong complacency and we can be spiritually nodding off to sleep. And that's dangerous. And this is essentially what this whole message for us, I think, is really all about. All right. So we need to remain vigilant. Um, so our loyal to Jesus Christ is not turned aside um, or diverted through the deceiving influence of the world and the behind that, the demonic powers. Um, talking about uh, keeping... Um, your clothes on, we are reminded again um, towards the end of Revelation uh, chapter 19, um, talking about the, the church, the, uh, the bride of Christ, the born again believers in Jesus. It was given to her, that is to us if we are in Jesus, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. And here's an explanation, we don't have to scratch our heads about what does this mean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So this is the clothes, the clothing that God wants us to keep on, the righteous acts of the saints. Now I need to be careful. It's not something that we do to earn our righteousness. It's a gift. In one of Jesus' parables, he talks about the wedding feast um, and when people didn't come, then they forced people from the byways and highways and from the gutters and everywhere. And they were given wedding clothes. But one person, for whatever strange reason, um, and chose not to take on the nice wedding clothes and gave in his filthy rags and was chucked out. They were given the wedding clothes. We are given righteousness, made whole, right standing holy before the holy God only through the work of Jesus Christ. But we need to hang on to that, hold on to that, and follow him with the power that he gives. So, the question comes, and this really is leading on to what we are continuing to talk about today. Who are we worshipping? I mean, really. Look at Jesus. If you're believers, you'll say Jesus, yes. And that's correct. But who are we really, really worshipping? If you haven't given your life to Jesus, you really need to pause to think. But even if we have given our lives to Jesus, it's good for us. It's important for us. According to the Bible, we need to pause and think. Are we worshipping other gods besides Jesus? What is important in our life? Jesus comes like a thief. So we need to be alert, aware, awake, against, and these two things are almost like two sides of the same coin. 
the deception of idolatry. Well, we don't worship idols. We don't put up little idols in our corner of our house and go about and worship to them. But hang on a minute. Is there something that we worship without actually necessarily praying to them, but something that takes the place of God, the place of Jesus in our hearts, in our interest, in what we focus on, what we spend our time and energy on? Yes, we need to work. We need to study. I'm not talking about that. Are we studying? Are we working? So I can become big and famous and great and have all these fantastic things. And God gives us things, what we need. And that's a good thing. But where's our heart? So in our heart of hearts, who are we worshipping? So idolatry is very deceptive. I mean, we, not, we ne may not be inclined to start bowing down to false gods or made of stone or wood or whatever. But as we see, the spirit of Babylon is very, very deceiving and wants to lead us astray. And we need to be alert so that we don't become disloyal to Jesus. So they go together, deceived and disloyal. First you're deceived and your heart goes cold. Like we are reminded um, early on in chapter 2 of Revelation about the church in Laodicea, maybe in chapter 3, um, he was not hot or cold, lukewarm. They thought, no, we're right, we're doing good, all good, thanks, no need here, and didn't realise. And in fact, again, Jesus advised them to get close because they don't realise that they are naked, again, not in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense. They did not have the righteousness of God. They had lost it. They had lost their wedding clothes, if you like. Now, then we read with the final bowl, and um, there was a lot of uh, upheavals. And uh, for, uh, verse 19, the great city, which is Babylon, was split into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. The Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. So again, Babylon. And this leads on to chapter 17 and 18, which um, uh, some people have thought that chapter 17 and 18, which talks about the doom and the fall of Babylon and bemoaning or lament for the fall of Babylon, which we'll look at presently, that it's like an extended appendix to that last bowl judgment, which I just read about. But before that, the finality, uh, the two finalities, um, which I want to con com contrast here, not compare, but contrast, because they are opposites. On the left-hand side, I was reminded of these words as I was reading, it is done, it sounds so final, and it is. What other similar phrase was there in the Bible? It is finished. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he had already spoken with the repentant thief and, and saying that today you'll be with me in paradise, etc. And already had that heart-wrenching cry, my Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? Because God turned, God the Father turned his back on his son hanging on the tree full of the sin of the world, our sin, our sickness, our infirmity. God turned his back. My Lord, why have you forsaken me? And then Jesus cried and said, it is finished and gave up his spirit. He didn't die a natural death because of suffocation or whatever. Uh, the crucifixion is a dreadful death. Um, but he gave up his spirit. And now I have completed my work. And God rose him again from the grave in three days. And after his resurrection, he appeared to many people. And before going to heaven, he gave us a task. Go and tell everyone else about the good news. Um, as we sang in, I think, the second last uh, chorus, for God so loved the world. That's the good news. 
as opposed to um, with the um, final bow judgment, there again a voice from heaven says, it is done. The judgments of God are now complete, finished, done. And we are reading about the effects of that last judgment, again, almost like an appendix to what has just been said, elaborating the detail on it is done. And that's a horrible finish. It's God's judgment on people who are repentant. So we have a choice. Which side are we on? Which finality is our finality? Which finish is our finish? Jesus paid the price in full. And the Bible says, and therefore there is now no judgment, no condemnation or judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. Or it doesn't mean that we won't have trials. It doesn't mean that Christians aren't martyred or persecuted, and that's increasing, as we'll see a bit later. But we will be victorious with him, no matter what as opposed to rejecting Jesus. And then there is only God's judgment, horrible judgment left. So this is a horrible, horrible message. Um, but it is the word of God. So it's important to note, as we look at these horrible things about God's final judgment, they are not for those or punishment for those who are in Jesus. God's final judgments are for Satan and his demonic hordes and the unrepentant people. However, we can be, we will be, we are suffering for Jesus, persecuted. Indeed, Tanya, I think it was you who said, I'm forgetting now, about taking up the cross. Oh, Sarah. Oh, yeah, that wasn't the message of the worst verse for the day. Sorry. Yes. I thought it wasn't quite right. From Matthew. Take up my cross every day and follow me. Yes, we are to take up our cross with the strength that God provides. So we are not left alone. God's judgment can be seen to work in two ways. It's a vindication uh, or approval of the oppressed saints. God will judge Satan for all the oppression um, and persecution of Christians and his people. But also, apart from the judgment of judging Satan, it is still, as we saw, it is still, God is, through this judgment, still trying to get the attention of the world for them to repent. And most people don't. So what is God looking for? He is looking for us to be, and someone said, and I think that's quite right, radical witnesses to him. But he's also looking for, and hopefully these are the same people, uh, not one or the other, people of prayer, who are moved by the Holy Spirit. Okay. Then, gets bad. Chapter 17 leading on to chapter 18 we see, again, some weird and wonderful images. I first thought of putting, uh, put up, putting up here another artistic depiction of these two things. A harlot on a scarlet beast, so these two. And if you read, which we are not reading uh, now, uh, some snippets, chapter 18 um, describes this really quite lewd prostitute or harlot who's clothed in scarlet blasphemous red and royal purple and flouting her wealth drunk on her harlotry and bad deeds and in fact drunk on the blood of the saints i mean it gets worse now these are actually really really quite horrible um r18 rated sort of um images Important to note here that yes, with this, and this is all now the satanic power and influence. And talking about this harlot, which I believe, uh, and in fact, I think the Bible fairly clearly says, 
um, in fact refers to Babylon, the mother of all harlots on earth, and the great king who lays, has led and still is leading people aside. And we'll look at Babylon in a minute. But this horrible woman um, does everything evil and is really the embodiment of the power of evil and doing his bidding and his work. And um, in a lot of ways, maybe actually related to ores can be seen as being also, and certainly the power with the Antichrist and all the judgment um, and destruction. Now, I'll put this, oh yeah, that's what I said. I was going to put this artist picture, but I didn't. I didn't want to put anything too lewd um, and horrible up there. Um, but, and it's not an artist uh, picture, but I got this picture of the sea of Tanga, actually, in Tanzania, and I cut out the nice shoreline and made it darker. The waters, because it says here that the harlot who sits on many waters, which can be interpreted as the many nations and uh, tribes and languages of people, so arising from that and in the doing, uh, carrying out all this immorality. Now, when we're talking about immorality here, it is, goes both ways. It is literal. Um, and you know, and we see every day in the world system, yes, there is a whole lot of uh, pornography, immorality, and who knows what. And uh, as I have been, again, reading more about world history just for the fun of it, it's actually pretty depressing about rulers and nations of the earth. I mean, um, I think the history we've read has been pretty sort of glossed over. Um, but the real history is exactly this stuff, really horrible stuff. But more so, idolatry is also in Bible, and particularly in the book of Revelation, well, actually all through the Bible, it talks about um, the idolatry, the spiritual harlotry or spiritual idolatry, and not following um, God's ways and um, doing all the, all the things. I mean, they say this um, harlot was drunk um, with the blood of the saints and the witnesses of Jesus, which really uh, talks to us that the people of the world, uh, stirred on by demonic influences, they are drunk with um, abundance of power and violence, uh, and especially false worship. And you could really see, if you read this description, it's almost like she has a lust for violence. Um, maybe in here, it's just another little sidestep. Um, um, I've got this from uh, the idea from the ESV study Bible, quite a useful summary of, um, um, it's really there, uh, well this is not the same as the um, uh, demonic um, the trinity, but close to it or similar to it. The beast attacks the church by violence and intimidation. The false prophet through deception and heresy and the prostitute we're reading about here, or Babylon, Babylon, says here, beguiling affluence. And a bit more on that shortly. But I would add to that idolatry in all its forms. So there are various ways uh, that the devil is attacking against God's people and the whole of God's system and plan for, um, uh, for the world, um, especially mankind. Then, um, then there's the scarlet beast, which I haven't got a picture here, and I won't. Uh, red beast, which we actually met in chapter 13. Uh, red beast um, which, uh, from the sea, which was the Antichrist. So the scarlet beast, which is also called Babylon, sits on essentially the Antichrist. So they go together, one carrying the other and supporting the other. And there's some strange descriptions here. I mean, well, the beast had seven heads and ten horns. A bit more about that lately. Short, uh, a bit later, but not too much. Um, it says in chapter 18, verse 8, about this beast that the beast was, is not, and is about to come. Now, that sounds a bit mysterious. It's been explained, interpreted, um, that, uh, because this is actually really depicting Satan and his power. Satan was, he had pretty well unchallenged power on earth for quite a while. 
but then he was defeated by Jesus. He's not. He's still there, but he's a defeated enemy. And he's yet to come. He will come at the end of time, and he'll be released for a short while to really wreak havoc. So his time will still come for a short time. But he is a defeated enemy. And again, this is a demonic, um, it's called parody, or really a gross misrepresentation of God. How many times in the book of Revelation have we read about God who was and is and is to come? And last time we said the is to come was left out because he has already come. God who was and who is and lives forevermore. So again, Satan tries to imitate that in all sorts of ways. And um, about the seven heads of the beast, and we saw that already in chapter 13, lots of interpretations, um, but it is actually fairly clear in script, the seven heads are seven mountains, it says that, seven mountains on which the woman sits, which are also seven kings, now, this gets confusing. Five have fallen of those seven kings. One is at the time of writing of the book of Revelation, and one is yet to come, but only remains for a short time. Now, I refer to this, um, and this is one interpretation, and there are different ones. That, uh, And to me, it makes sense that these might represent the mighty empires or kingdom in, kingdoms in the world, most of them in the time of antiquity, starting from Egypt, um, Assyria, Persia, Medo-Persia, uh, Greece, and uh, Rome, which at the time was. And the last one is yet to come, which many understand and I understand as um, the coming kingdom of the Antichrist in its full form, which is not here yet, but its force and effects are already very much increasing and apparent, but not yet in full force. Um, other peoples uh, make a lot about the seven hills because um, in history it's well known that Rome was built on uh, seven hills, the city on seven hills and even some of the Roman coins uh, it was uh, depicted as that and goes with the whole school of interpretation of revelation where uh, if, it re if it's thought that revelation is really talking about what has happened to date whenever it was written then people look at the empress of Rome and uh, seven emperors and who was and lots made about Emperor Nero um, and then uh, you can count them because the Rome had lots of emperors so you have kind of have to basically fudge their, inter their counting a bit because so after Nero there were three emperors who lived who ruled only for a short time and I think just by fluke got their power so if you leave them out then someone else is the seventh and so forth I don't really quite follow that and I'm not sure that that's what it means but a lot of people uh, sincere Bible interpreters see even Rome as the beast um, or Rome as the, um, the, the, um, the, the woman but uh, I'm not convinced I think it's broader and longer than that in the implication uh, mountains certainly in prophecy refer to seats of power world power and their demonic powers and then God's power and um, Pastor Kirsty actually put me on a few months ago to a really interesting book. I'm not sure if I mentioned about it in here. It's a bit heavy going by Michael Heiser. He's, an, he's a prominent uh, Old Testament scholar, a true believer, who studied, and I've got his book, which Kirsty and I are both studying. He's more versed in that than I am, The Unseen Realm. It is heavy going, but not difficult, but you need to concentrate. And he's written a number of others. That's really eye-opening. Uh, and I won't go into the background because he really knows what he's talking about. But about the demonic forces and, the, and in fact, God's um, heavenly structure and God's heavenly witnesses. Now, that's a long thing, and we might need to get Kirsty to talk about that at some point when he's ready. But I'll just make a quick reference. Also, when we talk about spiritual warfare, people realize that there are demonic spirits that are fighting and oppressing even Christians. And whether some people go overboard um, uh, or not, but Satan is real and his demonic forces are real. And it seems to be that there are high places 
physical, geographical high places, which are the domains of um, demonic rulers of a certain areas. And this may seem all a bit strange. But that makes sense when you look at it with this revelation also goes all together with these demonic forces and their influence on the kingdom of kingdoms of the world and individual people. And it just gets more and more intense. But, pause here. Ephesians 6.12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And in uh, chapter 17 of Revelation, these, all these demonic powers, they have one purpose, um, and they give their power and authority to the beast. And the beast fights against the lamb uh, and um, the saints of God. But eventually, so they give support um, uh, to the beast and glorify the beast, the devil, um, and lift up um, this harlot. Um, but then they flip and turn over and actually destroy her, devour her. So it reminds us of the actually self-destroying power of the devil, of evil. And God is sovereign. His purposes will be fulfilled. We don't un understand all this, but yes, God uses even evil, like the Egyptian pharaoh, who hardened his heart, would not let the Israelites go. So God worked through him to judge him, to punish him to illustrate his mercy and deliver the faithful. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Now then, let's quickly race on to Babylon. This is an artistic dep depiction of the old Babylon with its blue gates, etc., etc. In fact, the name Babel, Babylonia, um, has been interpreted, and if you look at Wikipedia, it says gate of God. But apparently the Hebrew rendering of it and the Hebrew lettering actually reads confusion, which reminds us of the first time we come across Babylon uh, or Babel, same thing in the Bible, which is in Genesis 11. God instructed, commanded, people, Adam and Eve, and their offspring to spread over the earth, to fulfill the earth. But what did they do? People moved east on the plain of Shinar, which is Babylon, and started to build a city. And said, let's build a name for ourselves. They want to reach God, reach heaven, so we don't get dispersed all over the earth, which was exactly the point what God wanted to do. So we have the confusion of languages. God came down, confused the languages of the people, and we are suffering ever since because we don't speak the same language. And, um, but already from back there, yes, the, the Babylon has been associated with this fighting against God, elevating self on the place of God, self-righteousness and confusion. And Babylon um, in the Bible has really been seen as the symbol um, of um, all demonic deception. And it's the key symbol or archetype of ungodly power in the world. Satan working through this Babylon, whether it be a literal city Babylon, like it was in Genesis, um, and subsequent cities, Babel and Babylon. Oh, I have maps. Can you see Babylon there? No, you can't. There it is, in here. So Israel's around here. That's the fertile crescent. Abraham left presumably from somewhere around here, and moved down and went to Egypt for a while and then came back, etc., etc. So Babylon is there. And uh, I pointed to Patmos. This is modern Turkey, and Patmos is further up there in the Aegean Sea off the coast of Turkey. Now, this is an old picture and a fuzzy one at that, what Babylon looked like in, uh, maybe a couple of decades ago. And in Wikipedia, you can see what the ruins of Babylon look like look like in 2005. Apparently Saddam Hussein wanted to rebuild Babylon to its former glory. I don't think that's happened. But anyway. 
Now, Babylon represents, it was the center of the, or the demonic religion uh, in the Bible, and not the only one. Um, uh, there are a number of um, descriptions of a harlot city in the Bible, not just Babylon. Um, but common to all of them, the to scholars, is they uh, show or you know, display royal dignity and splendor. Now, I have to stop here. I'm not being anti-royal here. That is not a political statement. I mean, there's God giving royalty and even God fearing royals, as we know. But any wrong system of self-glorifying and selfish without God or against God, her royalty or dignity or splendor, with prosperity, and abundance and luxury, so like this overabundance of huge wealth. And that's exactly what the description of the scar, the woman in um, chapter 18 or chapter 17 looks like, the, uh, the, uh, the harlot. Also, there's self-trust and boastfulness, power and violence, especially against God's people. There's oppression, injustice, and idolatry. So... Johnson, who's um, written um, a commentary on uh, Revelation, says, whenever there are idolatry, prostitution, self-glorification, self-sufficiency, pride, complacency, reliance on luxury and wealth, avoidance of suffering, and violence against life, there is Babylon. Now, many believe that there will actually still be a literal resurgence of Babylon or a kingdom of evil around Babylon, whether that's physically in Babylon or in that area of uh, Near East, be that as it may. But um, uh, at the same time, I think, if you like, there is this, and I've used the word carefully, spirit of Babylon, the demonic spirit, which has all this operating at work. And um, I don't think this means that we start doing a checklist, checking these different kingdoms, or does Australia have this, this, this? Actually, it's surprising if you think of it, how much of that we do have. It's scary. The influence of Babylon is infiltrating through human society, if we're not careful. Someone just while we were having coffee there before asked me, do I have a dual citizenship as in Australia and Finnish? I said, no, I'm just an Aussie. Apparently, there's been information come out. Uh, Finland's going to have a general ele or parliamentary elections. And believers are getting concerned, really concerned, because there's a very ungodly, unholy piece of legislation that's going to come up against parliament. So it's really needing prayer. It is the Babylonian spirit overturning all the laws of God. What is right is wrong, and what is wrong is right, in effect. So that certainly that influence is there. So Babylon can be seen to represent the total culture of the world apart from God. However, the good news, when we get to the final chapters of um, uh, Revelation, the New Jerusalem is in fact a divine system, or represents the divine system of God, where God is glorified. In the Babylon, man and self is glorified and self-sufficient. Un-God. But the new Jerusalem, those who are faithful, we bring glory to God and praise him for our salvation. And um, there's a, in chapter 18, um, and there's an announcement from heaven uh, with a loud, mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison of every unclean spirit, and a long description of all these evil things that I have uh, referred to and more. And what's strange, really strange, then for most of chapter 18, there's this lament for Babylon. Um, and it's lament by, uh, by kings, kings of the earth, rulers and powers of the earth, then uh, there's a lament by merchants, and then finally by shipmasters. And strange thing also with their crew and their passengers. They are all bemoaning and crying over the fall of Babylon. How did a great city fall in one day? And 
how horrible, and no one's buying our goods, and it's terrible, and um, what do we do now? Um, and that is God's judgment. One of the things which I do want to point out still about Babylon, and, and in fact, again, reading history, it seems that pretty well through the history of the world, in the kingdoms or empires of the world, one of the gravest um, uh, sins they have committed, apart from killing people and God's people, is slavery. And it's specifically mentioned also about this Babylon, um, like the high point of why she needs to be judged. Um, the trade in humans, cargoes of slaves and human lies. And we don't have to go that far back to look at the slave trade and the horrors of it and the consequences of that are ongoing in the world. And that's a sad, sad, more than sad, it's a really dark chapter of human history, a very long chapter. I don't know why have people, I mean, I know why. It's demonic. Why would you want to catch other people or capture your enemies? And that's what a lot of places they were doing. They had their tribal wars, caught the enemies, and because someone wants to buy them for cheap labor or non-existent unpaid labor and half them might have died on the way but who cared we buy some more it's horrible totally against god's um, purposes so at the end of chapter 18 there is a summary reason why god judges babylon and the systems of the world so severely For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and all who have been slain on the earth. All nations were deceived by her sorcery or idolatry and um, devil worship in some shape or form. And... Uh, and the blood of the saints and martyrs, responsibly of the Babylon. So that's why she was destroyed and wiped out. That brings me to this one slide. I got this um, information and copied this from uh, the Open Doors website. They have just published their very latest 2023 uh, report um, on persecution of Christians. So they have calculated, this is the latest figure, that in the world currently there are at least 360 million Christians who are suffering high level of persecution around the world. And those diagrams, I won't read them, depict one in how many in different parts of the world, except for the first one. In the whole world, one in seven Christian has been worked out. Okay, there's figures are figures. Um, but estimated, are actually facing not a simple, but severe persecution for their faith. How many are we here? One in seven. And in some places, one in five. Um, two in five. Let's pray for our suffering uh, brethren. Now, I skipped an important bit in chapter 18. And it's the call, come out of her. The call to the faithful in chapter 18, verse 4. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. For her sins have piled up against as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities, and so forth. And that's why the judgment came. Again, reminded me of um, the people uh, in Genesis 11, building the Tower of Babel. They wanted to reach to the high heavens, to God. Now their sins have been piled up as high as the heavens. And um, God is judging. But for us, come out of her, my people. It is high time for us to be pure and faithful in the sight of God. 
if we think that we have been pure and faithful so far, praise God. And we do that by the strength that God provides. But it is high time for us to be pure still. And I say this with uh, speaking to myself, first and foremost. There are, which I won't read now, time's gone, clear warnings in many places in the Old Testament, even using the word Babylon quite directly. Depart, depart, go out from there. Flee from the midst of Babylon and eat to save your life. And Jeremiah, I will punish Bel in Babylon. Come forth from her midst my people. I will, however, read uh, a poignant passage from the New Testament, and there are many others, but I will read from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, from verse 14. Do not, bar, do not be bound together. Um, pay attention to these words that I emphasize, different ways of connection with the wrong connection. So do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness, or what harmony has Christ with Belial, or the Satan, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols. For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out of, their, out of their midst, and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And I think that's a message for us today. We are strangers and lions um, in this earth, Peterites, and need to abstain from um, the works of the flesh. So getting to the close. We are, you may have heard this before, in the world but not of the world. And that makes a huge difference. Jesus, in his high priestly prayer before his suffering, prayed for the disciples. Father, I pray for these, for they are in the world, that you keep them from the evil one. And I also pray for those who believe after them, that you keep them, Father. We need that prayer. We are in the world but not of the world. It doesn't mean that we build monasteries. If God so calls someone to a monastery to study and pray and copy the scripture, that's God's business. But most of us are living in the world, carrying our cross every day, being witnesses of Jesus. Separate from all forms of Babylon, and I've only given a very rough, quick summary and you may wish to read those horrible chapters in revelation they are still the word of god as horrible as they are and it gives more clear and um, quite shocking description of the ways of the world may god keep us from all lure or attraction of that holiness means separation from the world to god so, time is for the pure to be pure still. Abbreviating from uh, to, right towards the end of a revelation. Let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. So, what do, does all this speak to us? A lot of things. I've summarized a few points. Firstly, there is a real unseen demonic world or realm out there which is stirring the powers of the world according to their demonic purposes. And I think that stirring is getting more and more intense. And we see it reading the news, watching the news, watching movies, whatever media, we see this is all ramping up. Number two, God will not tolerate sin and idolatry for very long. And note again, I'm talking about idolatry as 
all sorts of things that come between us and God. Separate from her, go out from her. So that we, the faithful, which is us, we need to come out of the world's temptations. Be in the world, but separated from it. And we can't do it. But we are saved by grace alone. And we live for Christ in holiness. And the last point, therefore, now more than ever, we need God's help. And we've got that available to us through the Holy Spirit. So guess what? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. So you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh, Paul writes. Remember back to what we were looking at, and God will enlighten you further about Holy Spirit last year. We spent quite a few weeks looking at that. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to be present with us. And the New Testament makes it clear. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit again and again. Live in the Spirit of God. He draws us close to him. He gives us the power and strength uh, to be his witnesses. And uh, to him be all the glory. So therefore, it is time, um, my friends, for the pure to be purer still. May God help us. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. Yes, Lord, it's a harsh word and a lot of things we don't understand and we'd rather not read from the Bible, but they are there for a purpose. Let them be reminding us today, Lord, and stirring us on to be putting away all the things that bind us down or hold us down or come between us and you, our Lord. Yes, Lord, we want to recommit ourselves to live for you, be your witnesses in this world, live for you in your glory and in your power, doing the works that you give us to do. Give us the strength and power and love and patience that we need from you. In Jesus' name we pray. And we thank you that you have promised to be with us till the end of the age. And we, we desperately need that. And thank you and worship you for that. You are the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. I don't often do this, and I'm doing it before we turn the um, internet off. Please be praying and maybe bow your heads and close your eyes. If there's anyone who's not sure whether you, you are right with God. If you haven't actually given your life over to Jesus, do you want to slip your hand up and we'll pray for you, even on the, in the internet. If that's you, pray to God and I will pray a prayer for people who want to commit their life to Jesus shortly. In fact, I'll do that now. Lord, you see any of us, any of you here who are listening or listening on the internet later, who know in their, deep in their hearts that now I'm not right with God. I have not given my life to Jesus. Thank you for speaking to those people, Lord, today. Keep speaking to them, Lord. And thank you for your promise that whoever comes to you, you will not by any means throw away. So anybody who comes to you now, Lord, even listen to these words, I pray for them and thank you for them. Lord, thank you for this person, that person who's turning their heart to you, Lord. Forgive their sins. Help them confess their sins before you, Lord. And you will say that, my child, your sins are forgiven. And that is your finality. When you have forgiven our sins, our sins are not remembered anymore not any longer. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for that. And help anyone who's made that decision today to learn more about you through your word, the Bible, and seek out friends who are believers in the church of God, the true followers of Jesus, that we can grow together. And I also want to ask while we are praying, any of us, all of us, if you've been challenged by this message, I, don't, I didn't want to be challenging you as Kari, me. But I feel that this is such a strong message from God, that God is challenging a number of us to become holier still, 
to make a new commitment to live totally for Jesus. If that's you, would you lift your hand up and I'll pray for you. Yes, the Lord sees that. Yes, yes. Yeah, many people. Many of us have been living for Christ earnestly for a long time. But before such a message, we are humble before God. Lord, you see, all of us, us here who lifted our hands, and I want to lift my hand as well, Lord, with them. And people on the internet watching, who are lifting their hands there, at home or wherever, Lord. Lord, thank you that you've seen our cry to you. You've seen our uplifted hand, the thoughts of our heart and mind. We've admitted that we could be more committed to you. This is not a false sense of guilt, Lord, but your gentle reminder through your Holy Spirit that it is high time to be fully committed. It is time for the holy to be holier still. Lord, we praise you for the holiness you've given us because Jesus, you have paid the price for our sin. We cannot understand that. We cannot fathom that enough. We thank you and praise for that. And now we implore you, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit, help us to grow and be molded in our daily life and our spiritual life, our practical life, to be more and more like you. And I thank you and praise you, Lord, that you promised to do that. So there is no shadow of doubt whether you will do it or not. You will do it. And this prayer of our heart is beautiful and acceptable to you. We thank you and praise you, Lord. And thank you for being with us each and every day, walking us, whether we're sleeping or awake. In Jesus' name I pray for this whole church and your children. In Jesus' name. Amen. Tanya.